My name is Robert Marks. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery and professor of orthopedic surgery at Hospital for Special Surgery and Weill Cornell Medical College. In this video, we're going to discuss physical examination of the knee. I always start with the patient standing and walking to evaluate their gait and after walking, their alignment. By walking, we can also watch them walk away and look at the back of their knee to make sure there's nothing with the skin or any deformities posteriorly that you otherwise wouldn't see with the patient lying supine. By examining their gait, we can look for antalgic gait, varus or valgus thrust, flex knee gait, or other abnormalities. Lastly, we'll check their alignment. So starting, we'll ask our patient to walk towards us and then turn around and go back. And at this point, we can look at the back of their leg, make sure there's nothing in the popliteal fossa. And then walk towards, towards me again. And to check their alignment, you can face the uh, camera for a moment. To check their alignment, I'll ask them if they're in valgus, it's usually fairly obvious with a normal stance. But to check for varus, I'll have them put their feet together so that they're touching. And if there's any space between their knees, pull the shorts up just a little bit, please. If there's any space between their knees, which there isn't in this case, I will call that varus. And the more space there is, the more varus alignment. In this case, I would call that alignment relatively normal. The first thing when examining the patient's knee is to be on the side of the table where you have immediate access to the knee, not reaching across to examine the other knee. And so to do that, if the table is against the wall, I'll have the patient turn around when I examine the opposite knee. The other thing is make sure the patient's comfortable so that they can relax, have something under their head. And I also like to have their feet on the table so you can also ass assess that they have full extension and also check for hyperextension. So I like to have their feet on the table, something under the head, and allow them to relax. When we get to the ligament portion of the exam, I'll ask them to put their hands at their side, which enables them to relax even further. The first part of the knee exam is inspection, looking at the skin and any other abnormalities that are immediately visible, including effusion. Sometimes an effusion is visible, but there are methods we use to test for the size of the effusion, starting with the fluid shift test, sweeping medially, and then laterally, seeing if the fluid in the knee shifts back. If it does, it means there are a little, there's a little fluid in the knee. If the knee looks visibly swollen, we blot for the size of the effusion, and if there's so much fluid in the knee that it can't be shifted, you can blot it as you would a plastic baggie full of water. The fluid shifts around and you can feel it moving around, but it's too much fluid to shift side to side because the knee is full of fluid. So the knee may either have no fluid, a little bit of fluid you can do on the fluid shift test to evaluate it, or belotable and sometimes in between. So you can shift the fluid, but there's enough fluid you can belot it, but not so much fluid that you can't shift it. So there's no fluid, shiftable, shift and belot, and just belot because there's too much fluid to shift back and forth in the knee. The knee is too full. So that's how I evaluate for effusion. After that, I'll move on to palpation. And there's a lot of structures around the knee you can palpate and learn valuable information from if the patient has tenderness. Starting with the front of the knee, the quadricep tendon, the patella, medial and lateral facets, checking also for patellar glide, and I'll use this point in the exam to palpate for, not really palpate, but assess for patellar apprehension. So with a laterally directed force, if the patient has apprehension, that's an indication they may have had recurrent patellar instability. Along those lines, you can palpate the medial retinaculum, which also may indicate recent patellar instability. The patellar tendon is anterior on the knee, the tibial tubercle, and with knee flexion to 90 degrees, we'll palpate the joint lines, both laterally and medially. Sometimes to bring out tenderness, you have to push quite hard, and I'll use two fingers to kind of press on that joint line to elicit discomfort if indeed the joint line is tender. You can palpate the iliotibial band laterally, and there's a test we'll use to assess for ITB tightness at the end, the Ober test, and also the medial epicondyle. Sometimes in MCL injuries, the ligament won't be loose, but commonly the injuries proximally at the ligament where it originates near the medial epicondyle, just proximal and posteriorly, and palpating around the epicondyle 
can be the only clue that there's a low grade or grade one MCL sprain. And lastly, the pes anserinus tendon insertion and the pes anserinus bursa, about three, four, five centimeters below the joint line can also be tender on the medial side. After palpation, I'll move on to range of motion. Now, in the setting of an acute knee injury, sometimes you can't really do some of these maneuvers because the patient's too uncomfortable. So they're not necessarily all applicable in the setting of an acute knee injury. With range of motion, we'll check both active and passive. In this case, the patient has full extension, but does not come into hyperextension at all. But hyperextension is very important to document on both sides. With flexion, we'll ask them to bend their knee up all the way actively, and also passively, see what kind of flexion they have. And then while I'm in this position, I'll use this opportunity to check forced flexion and McMurray test. So I'll flex their knee all the way forcibly a little bit, see if that elicits pain. And also then grab the heel or ankle, and with forced flexion, rotate internally and externally the tibia below the femur, which is the way I perform McMurray's test to assess for discomfort related to the meniscus. And then lastly, when I'm in this position, always examine the hip. So I'll flex the hip up, check internal and external rotation to document range of motion, but most importantly, to assess for discomfort because you can have a hip, primary hip pathology presenting with knee pain and you always have to examine the hip to make sure that it isn't the hip that's causing the problem. In other words, that the patient isn't presenting to you complaining of knee pain when it's the hip causing the problem. So at the end of my motion, after forced flexion of McMurray test, I'll check the hip and ask if I'm reproducing any knee pain by examining their hip joint. We'll then move on to ligament examination, which is particularly important to do on both sides. And as I said, I'll come to the other side of the table to do it, or if the table's against the wall, I'll reverse the patient's position. When examining the ligaments, it's absolutely critical that the patient is perfectly relaxed, have something under their head, make sure they're comfortable. I like the feet on the table so the feet are not hanging off the edge, arms at the side to ensure maximal relaxation. And the last thing I'll always do is tell them to relax their hip so that their foot is, ex or both feet actually are externally rotated, which allows all the muscles in the leg to relax. If their feet are pointing up, their toes are pointing straight up, there's some tension in the hip and the leg won't be maximally relaxed. With the knee exam, I'll start with the collaterals. So in full extension, checking medial and lateral laxity and then slight flexion, about 20 degrees. I'll make sure they're totally relaxed and I'll often use this technique, sort of roll their leg a little bit to get them to relax, cradle their hamstrings, also help them relax, tell them their, let their hip loose, let their foot turn out, and get them fully relaxed and check their collaterals in both full extension and slight flexion. I'll then move on to Lachman test to evaluate the ACL, done at about 15 or 20 degrees of flexion. I'll hold the, let your leg relax, totally loose, totally loose. I'll sort of roll it back and forth, grab the hamstrings, let it relax a little, and I'll examine the knee with the hips slightly externally rotated and holding the femur very solidly, translate the tibia slightly forward. And then you can feel both amount of translation and end point. What we mean by end point is how the ligament snaps to tension at the end, how it comes, you feel the tightness at the end as opposed to a soft end point when you don't really feel an end point because the ligament's torn and you just feel it gliding. And you, sometimes you can actually See it visually there, you can see that endpoint. Uh, sometimes it's not so, it's so, so obvious to see, it's more the, the, the feeling you get examining the patient. And then for the PCL, we'll examine the knee at 90 degrees and you'll feel step off of the tibial plateau in front of the condyle. And there's a little step, the tibia sits in front of the medial femoral condyle and you can feel the amount of step off. Compare that, of course, side to side. As for all ligaments, and also, you can examine the ACL in terms of the pivot shift test. Really important to get the patient to relax. Can't do it often in an acutely injured knee. Uh, and the way I do the pivot shift test is to get them to totally relax. You go full extension and just flex the knee up and look for the lateral tibial plateau reducing as the knee flex, which makes a little shift graded as a glide. Is a, a one plus where you just see a little, a little glide, not even a, a shift a two plus where you see the tibia actually shift back into place, and a three plus where it's 
grossly pivoting where the knee kind of locks out and you see like a big clunk, which is not that common, but it does happen. To evaluate for posterolateral corner laxity, in addition to varus stress, which I demonstrated already, we'll also use the posterolateral spin test, feeling lateral step off of the plateau and spinning the tibia back, feeling if that step off is different side to side, indicating posterolateral laxity. You can also evaluate posteromedial laxity and posterolateral at 90 degrees. Also, stress x-rays can be very, very valuable to assess for medial and lateral laxity, comparing for side-to-side -side differences in terms of millimeters of opening. It's critical also to evaluate the neurovascular status of every patient every time so that it's just part of your routine. If you make your routine the same every time, you won't forget things. So I'll do a motor sensory examination every time as well as evaluate their pulses, which doesn't take very long at all, and I'll show you how I do it. Pull your toes straight up towards your head, both sides, keep them up, strong, strong. Push down, all the way down, push hard, hard. And do you feel me touching you there? Feel me touching you there, there, all that feels normal, all that feel normal, there, everything feels normal. That's motor and sensory evaluation, and I'll check pedal pulses, dorsalis pedis, post tib, bilaterally, and that way you're complete every single time and you'll never forget to evaluate when it really may matter, such as in the setting of a knee dislocation. Iliotibial band syndrome is a common cause of lateral knee pain related to the iliotibial band getting tight laterally and causing friction discomfort over the distal lateral femur. The way to evaluate for this, in addition to palpating the distal ITB, is to check for asymmetry in tightness, which is best done with the Ober test. So this is done in the decubitus position. Please lie on your right side. And then pull your bottom or right knee up towards your chest and left your, let your left leg relax, totally loose. I'll stabilize the pelvis so that the patient isn't rolling around. Pull the left hip, this, in this case the top hip, into extension. Right hip pulled up towards his chest. And then just let your leg relax, totally loose. And then we'll see how far the left knee hangs towards the table. In this case, he's totally relaxed. It hangs about halfway to the table. And if the other side hangs less towards the table, then that's an indication there's ITB tightness and confirms the diagnosis of ITB syndrome or iliotibial band syndrome.